In this lesson, we are talking about cell membrane and membrane transport. We're still in unit one, topic one. Here are our syllabus links and our Pearson text references. Please make sure you take a moment to read through them and the cognitive verbs associated with them, okay? Okay, the cell membrane. Now, the cell membrane encloses the entire cell. It separates the internal environment of the cell from the external environment. Um, and in single cellular organisms, um, you know, the outside world, otherwise the extracellular world. So they're made of many, many components, which make uh, a fluid carpet kind of thing. We talk about a fluid, uh, dynamic fluid membrane, and it covers the entire cell uh, and, and decides what is coming and going, what uh, substances can and come and go through it. That means it's selectively permeable. Now, this is the fluid mosaic model. There have been many other models that have built up to this one. This is the one we're, we're sticking with. It's the Singer-Nicholson Singer model. Now, it's a bilayer, so two layers of phospholipids with proteins embedded in it. It is a little bit fluid. Okay, the phospholipid bilayer is moving and changing. There's cholesterol in there to kind of solidify it a little bit. But the, the um, little phospholipids, which actually look like little uh, squiggly balloons there with two strings, they are moving around they do not stay stationary in one spot they're also external proteins that can anchor say things like carbohydrates and it's a mosaic it's little bits and pieces and all different components all stuck together so the components of a cell membrane there are some major ones that we really need to focus on number one is the phospholipid bilayer so all these little blue heads and all their red uh, stringy looking tails that are dangling down now their heads are hydrophilic right these are lipids they have a hydrophilic head which means they are water loving they are polar right and they point outwards to both the outside world and the inside of the cell whereas their legs that are dangling down these are non-polar and they are hydrophobic they do not like water which is why they kind of point in together so if you threw a whole bunch of phospholipids into a bucket of water they would actually rearrange themselves like this so the tails don't have to touch the water and so the heads uh, can manage to now, there are also large proteins involved in here. Now, some of them are embedded into the bilayer and go from one end to the other. They are integral proteins. They are transmembrane. They are crossing the membrane. They are also protein channels. They allow substances to flow through them. Uh, there are also peripheral proteins. There are proteins that sit just on the top. They do not go all the way through. Uh, but mostly these proteins, channels are important, about, uh, important for transport of substances through. But these peripheral ones can be about uh, cell to cell recognition or enzymes and hormone signaling, things like that. Okay, there are also glycoproteins. This is a glycoprotein because what it's got on top of it is a carbohydrate chain. Now, these are used for cell to cell recognition, so cells know, you know what type of cell is next to them, um, and also adhesion so they can stick to other cells for a certain reason. There's also little cholesterol molecules embedded in between the phospholipids, and this stabilizes that really fluid bilayer. So many cell membrane models exist out there. You'll see so many different depictions. Uh, some of them are very, very complex. Some of them are very, very simple. Uh, we can also model it ourselves. But you need to remember that regardless of what you see, it is a 3D membrane. It covers the entire cell. So if you're talking about a water balloon, uh, you know, you're talking about the entire latex part around the outside. It's not a doona sitting on a bed like you often see in these models. But they should all contain the same components, the bilayer of phospholipids, the proteins, cholesterols, and the carbohydrates. The selective permeability of the membrane um, allows a cell to function in exactly how it needs to and perform those basic uh, tasks it need to and get its basic requirements for life. So it must gain some nutrients um, and expel waste as well. But that selective permeability means it, you know, it's in charge of what's coming in and when it's coming in and in how, um, in what quantities. There's different types of transport methods that get things across the membrane, right? Passive transport versus active transport. And passive transport means it's just happening, okay? Active transport requires some energy. So the passive transport does not require our body to expel any energy or expend any energy, but the active transport does. And ATP is our cellular currency, and we'll learn more about that when we talk about cellular respiration. The types of passive transport we will talk about are osmosis, diffusion, and facilitated diffusion, but the active transport ones are about iron pumps and endo and exocytosis.
It's really important to understand the concentration gradient for a start. Okay, the distribution of particles across a space can go from a, a high concentration, they're very packed together, to a very low concentration in this direction. Substances want to travel from an area of high concentration to low concentration. If we smushed you all into the sports hall uh, and squished you all in one corner, you would want to move apart from each other to have that space. Particles do the same thing. All right, our passive transport to start with. In diffusion, that spreading out of the particles along the concentration gradient is happening. Okay, we're moving from areas of high concentration of particles to low concentration of particles. Now, this is a very dynamic process. If it's, excuse me, if it's happening across a membrane, it's not just happening in one direction, it's going to happen across Oh, sorry, across multiple ways. So some of these particles, yes, they're going to want to go from here and across, but some of these will travel that way and some of these will travel that way. It's about the net. It's about overall, most of them are going to move in this direction. This can happen without any energy, without any help. These are substances that can just move across the lipid bilayer. In facilitated diffusion, however, they might be substances moving that are too big to just push through. So they need protein channels to be able to do that. The center of the membrane is hydrophobic. Remember, those legs don't want to touch any water. So positive and negatively charged ions need some help to get through. And the cells control what type of channels they make uh, based on what their job is. But it's still passive transport. No energy is expended. Osmosis is a movement of water across the concentration gradient. So it's kind of diffusion of water and the water is the solvent. Usually it's dissolving a bunch of other substances and it's more mobile than the solute and often much smaller. So um, it can still use um, uh, protein channels to go through. These are called aquaporins um, and it just allows for that flow to move much, much quicker. Um, however, they're still kind of going in single file. All right, our active types of transport uh, often involve transport proteins. Okay, those proteins embedded in the membrane, they are carrier proteins as opposed to the channel where everything can just flow through. And these actually change form to allow those uh, substances that are usually um, ions to travel through. So ions can add the protein changes shape and it can expel them on the other side. And, and it's kind of like elevated doors, which only open in one direction. So it's obviously a bit more slow and much more specific. As an, an example of this is axons or nerve cells, um, and they do this with sodium and impulse to, to carry all the way down through a nerve. All right, endocytosis is helpful when we want to transport large things that may not fit through some of those protein channels. So a cell might like to push out some antibodies to fight infections. Um, it might need to take in some food for digestion or bacteria to destroy. Uh, now, this can occur due to that fluidity of the membrane. It means the membrane can wrap around other things and pull them in and then rearrange itself. The phospholipids can rearrange themselves, as you can see on this side over here. Now, this is a really common thing in white blood cells. And this is a white blood cell that's moved into... Um, or a macrophage, sorry, that's in the, the bloodstream. And what it's doing is chasing a piece of, you know, a little bacteria there, and that's where it's going to endocytose it. It's actually going to take it into itself so it can break it down and, and spit it out, essentially. Exocytosis is the opposite, okay? It's doing the same job, but instead of bringing things into the cell, it is expelling things in large quantities. And these little things here, the little bubble, that's called a vesicle, and it's made by more phospholipids. You can still see it's a bilayer, and it fuses with the external membrane, opens up, and releases the waste. So you might be talking about digestive enzymes in your digestive system, um, made in the ribosomes on the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, excess water can be removed like this as well with little contractile vacuoles and they can kind of spit it out if they're single cellular organisms like a paramecium. All right, here are our syllabus links. A reminder to read through them, pay attention to the cognitive verbs and also check your Pearson text for references and do some reading.